Wendy, hi, how's it going? Hi. It's going great, thank you. Happy to be here. Congratulations, 10 seasons. Thank Not you. a lot of shows get 10 seasons, very, very few. How does it feel? Um, wow, you know, I wish I had a really great way to describe it, but I just, I, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky that, that I get to do this. You know, this is so far the second longest job I've ever had in my life. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, pretty cool. Yeah. Second longest after, um, after an office job I had the office right. job. Right. I'd read about how you were talking about how you held on to it. Big break yes. from big break from bridesmaids and then book the Goldbergs the next year. How, how was that for you? I mean, you're, yeah, you're talking I, about that I a lot. That's that your job up until the Goldberg. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. You talk about holding on to that. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a lot of what your, your podcast is about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that there's no, you know, that the, when, when things happen, they happen. Yes, exactly. Um, well, and especially because this business is really flaky and you could be on a series one day and then not be able to make your car payment the next month. Like, that's just how it is. This is a flaky business and it's good to have something that anchors you into reality. Mm -hmm. um, because if you don't have that, then you, you end up hating acting because you're just relying on it for money and for you know to take care of everything and it's like well that's not how the arts work so um yeah i'm i'm lucky that i have that and uh how was that that was pretty insane when that when that happened when i got the goldbergs we last spoke you've been and you've become an executive producer of the yes. goldbergs and you're also doing the same i noted for uh for reno 911 as well right well that's fine <laughs> Because, yeah, we, I mean, on Reno, especially because we, you know, we created those characters ourselves. Each individual person created their characters. And everything you hear is coming out of our brain. Like nothing is scripted. So it makes sense that we should be able to weigh in on storylines and, and things like that. But the Goldbergs, um, I never thought, oh, yeah, I really want to EP this show or anything like that. But I have been there um, for a long time, as have the kids. Mm -hmm. um, but behind the scenes, I have been able to weigh in on some things that, you know, maybe they can't mm -hmm. just, you know, experience wise. And um, God, how do I say this without saying too much? I... Uh, I luckily never overplayed my hand by running to production with every little problem that I had. So they know when I come to them with something, it's real. And they usually listen to me. So, you know, it makes sense that I would that I would get that credit. And that's very nice that they offered it to me. So, um, you know, one of the things actually that I had done um, since we last spoke, one of my pandemic activities was was watching the Goldbergs, was re-watching. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was curious for you, do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite episode? Oh, goodness. Yeah, I I rewatch the entire the entire series before each season starts. So I can just be back up to speed. And I love any of our holiday episodes. I love the dinner with the Goldbergs episode. Mm. I love anything where the kids are trying to find love and it ends up really awkward. I love the episode called Oats and Oats where there's a <laughs> a telethon and um, the boys are going to be hauling oats, but neither one checks in with the other of who they're going to be so they both end up being john oates singing oh here she comes and yeah. that's all they both sing during the telethon um yeah and we've and this season we've got some really really funny things that happen and i am so excited for everyone to see our thanksgiving episode this year because mm. it's going to be insane 
but yeah. in the best way, you know, in the way that big family gatherings are always like off the charts annoying. <laughs> yeah. You know, dinner with the Goldberg, certainly one of my favorites too. And that I'm glad you mentioned the holiday episodes because, you know, with Halloween coming up, did one this year, maybe, I don't know, a couple's costume. I really like that one. Maybe when uh, Beverly's running down the street as the predator. That was fun. Yeah. Accusing, <laughs> accusing all the other parents of putting, you know, terrible things in the candy and then she goes and is bullying children into giving up their candy I don't know I thought that was so funny let's talk about this season because you mentioned mm -hmm. it and I've been watching it um some of the episodes that we're going to touch on are your premiere but also um now last week's episode with the birth of course that was a really hard-hitting episode it was it was really it was really emotional too I wasn't yeah. expecting that yeah. What's it been like with, um, you know, since that episode focused a lot on um, Haley, what's it been like working with? I mean, Haley has always been like one of my favorite sparring partners on the show. You know, I love the mother daughter dynamic of like, mom, just get off my back. But I think she's going to end up being just like her mother. You know, that's the funny thing. Moms and daughters butt heads, and then they turn out being exactly the same. So Haley's awesome. It's been so fun to watch her be pregnant. Obviously, she's not pregnant, but everyone treats her. It, you put on that pregnancy pad, and everybody starts to baby you. It's mm -hmm. so funny. I had to do it once for another project, and people were, like, helping me step up the curb. You know, like, I can't walk that, I can't lift my leg six inches. I'm fine. This is not real, you guys, remember? But, um, yeah, it's been great. And uh, I love watching this new parent dynamic, mm -hmm. you know. And it's a good thing they're under Bev's roof. That's all I can say. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I, I think you mentioned that the last time, you know, that a smother kind of leads to another smother, whether they want to or not, right? Yeah, yeah. But then when you got your own little nugget, you're like, oh, I don't want anything bad to happen to you ever. You know, so the instinct is there and it's not a terrible instinct, you know. But yeah, it's it's very fun watching that dynamic. And of course, we've got the sweetest babies in the whole universe playing yeah. Muriel. Yeah, Muriel. I want to ask you this because, I mean, you know, the transformation into Beverly is such a fascinating one. I'm almost tempted to call you Beverly. <laughs> Have you ever nicked one of the costumes? Um, no, there's absolutely nothing there that I would take. <laughs> um, no. Uh, no, I haven't. I, I lived through that in the 80s. I don't need to <laughs> live through it again. Um, although there is one jacket that I might want to have preserved in Lucite and hang it on the wall, maybe for memorabilia, but yeah, I, I've never nicked any of the costumes. Do you have a favorite that you've worn? Um, there's some fun jumpsuits that they've had made, especially for me. Oh. But I would, you know, people always ask about the sweaters. Um, there are a couple of sweaters that are absolutely insane, but those were made. They weren't donated by the real Bev. So sometimes in the in the script, it'll say something like, Bev walks in wearing a sweater that says breakfast, and there's a dancing piece of bacon and a skillet. <laughs> like Those are created by our brilliant costume designer, uh, Carrie Smith. Um, those are, you know, now that I think about it, maybe one of those would be fun to nick, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't. No. I don't take things that don't belong to me. <laughs> and they would definitely be noticed too. They, it would be noted, yes. And then the word would get out that I'm a horrible person. I'm not gonna do that. They're pretty loud pieces. Can't be replaced but, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so what? A, tell me a little bit more about this season because I am, very much looking forward to Thanksgiving episodes. I I love that you have so many holiday episodes. And yeah. I don't know, this season just feels like 
Um, you talked about how much you enjoy having Judd Hirsch on, mm -hmm. for example, and he's you know, yeah. great on the show. Saw him in The Fablemans in a bit of a different role, and that was fantastic to see. Yes. Oh, um, good. listening to Judd Hirsch on set, it's like, okay, Judd, just just talk. We're we're fascinated. I want to hear everything that you have to say. He's a legend. So yes, he did talk to us about the Fablemans, and I'm dying to see this. It's everything he's done is so iconic. And he loves what he does. And it's so contagious. You know, and and it's like we miss George for yeah. that reason. Like he loved what he did. And he has so many great stories and you just want to absorb all of them because you're so lucky to be in their presence. Um, but, you know, this season we're, we're dealing with Adam not having been ready to go to college, which, by the way, I think is a very poignant thing, a very poignant storyline. I wasn't ready to go. I didn't know why I was going to college. I think that's more common than people want to admit is like, well, just because you're 18 and you should go to college doesn't mean you're ready. And especially when there's been a family loss and things like that, you want to stay at home. But also, if you do that, that year can be kind of like <laughs> full of uncertainty and doubt and like wasted time. A lot, of, a lot of time spent in sweats laying on the couch eating Cheerios and watching TV. I mean, that's, that's what my... Mm -hmm time was like when I wasn't in college. So um, we're going to watch Adam navigate that. We're going to watch Barry navigate, you know, having love with Joanne and, um, you know, also trying to finish medical school. We're going to watch the kids learn about parenthood and, and try to say, hey, Back off, Bev. This is our bit, our baby. It's not your baby. Yeah. This is our baby. What do you um, think it's going to be like? Yeah, with that dynamic of everybody under one roof with the baby and, you know, becoming a I grandmother. Think I think it's going to be chaotic and yet comforting in the best way. You know, um, we're all coming off a pandemic where a lot of people moved back home. Mm. And a lot of people... You know, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the multi generational household. Quite honestly, <laughs> like, don't leave until you're ready. But once you're gone, you better stay gone. You better have your stuff figured out. You know, so I love that they're back at home. I love that Pop Pop lives there. I love that Uncle Marvin's coming back. Bev might, you know, after an acceptable period of grief, start trying to date mm. but I don't know that that's going to go very well you know mm. <clears throat> is she doing it for her reasons or for other people's reasons like it's just hard for her to navigate being you know being a widow so I think you know we, we've got a lot of fun stuff going and and that means also that my frentas get to come back a lot which is yeah. amazing yeah. Whatever they're on set, that's a good, a good episode for me. You touched upon it a few questions ago. I don't want to let that go because I'm re-watching and I'm watching your uh, season premiere from last season, the Goldberg's Excellent Adventure. What's your favorite memory of working with George? Um, one of my favorite things is well first of all that he had so many stories and he wanted you to ask him questions you know one of my favorite things is him holding court in front of the kids and telling them his stories of you know old hollywood and then my other i have a lot of good memories of him just like ribbing the crew for different reasons because that's one of the things he said is that you always make friends with the crew. Mm. They make you look good. So learn their names, you know, just a very gentlemanly thing to do. Um, but watching him rib them sometimes was hilarious. He was so much funnier than you can even imagine. 
And when we, I mean, after, after a certain amount of years, every time he would walk on set, we would kind of give him a standing ovation. <laughs> like, just for being there, mm -hmm. just for being there. We knew how lucky we were. And during the pandemic, you know, we never shut down, but we were very considerate of his time. We didn't bring him in every week. We would, you know, bring him in and then shoot all his scenes for several episodes and then let him go and not come back for a while. So whenever he would come back, it was like, yes, the king has arrived, you know. <laughs> Um, have his favorite foods on hand and let's make this really expedient. And um, I don't know. I, you know, one time he was wearing this velour sweatsuit because that Pops was always wearing velour. And he, he looked at himself in the mirror. He goes, oh my God, look at how these make my eyes pop. Look at this color. It looks amazing on me. And I was like, you're right. You're right, George bask in your handsomeness i don't know he's amazing and i miss him every day you have talked about that i want to pick up on that that you worked throughout the pandemic and you called it healing too so what was yeah. that experience and you know when you're shooting a show that's set in 1980 something you can't exactly refer to it yeah. so yeah what's what was it what was that experience like and how did you feel that that was really healing for you to work throughout this time um it was it was very healing in that it felt good to be doing something and and be connected to the outside world again. And even though it was not easy, mm -hmm. um, and you know, you look at those episodes and sometimes our hair is out of place and we're shiny and the continuity is weird, you know, just because there was a protocol when the actors are on set, other people can't be on set except for the bare minimum. And it was it was really hard, but knowing that we were making a comfort show that a lot of people did discover during the shutdown, you know, perfect time to binge television and knowing that, yeah, it was in the eighties and you're just going back to a different time and you're not thinking about anything political. You're just thinking about the warm fuzzies of this family or the awkwardness of this family you're just focusing on you know these these themes that everybody feels at some point everybody feels that these things with their family it it felt good that we were adding to that we were we were doing a comfort show we weren't there trying to you know stir up things politically we weren't trying to reinvent the wheel we're just you know putting out good comfort viewing and that kind of means everything because I, I feel like this show will never be off the air. It will always be syndicated somewhere. You know. I just wanted to tell you the last time that we talked, I got to tell you that your movie Poppy Chulo was going to be premiering at TIFF. I had broke the news to you. And then actually I later on got to tell Matt Bomer that I had told you about that. And I got to see the movie and it was really, really good. I know you have paint as well coming up and then um, just announced yesterday that, you know, Reno 911 is going to be doing a, a, a Christmas heist. So I, I think it's so incredible the way that you're able to weave in um, your different pursuits, different movies while doing the Goldbergs. I think that's yeah. really incredible about all yeah, the work that you're I'm doing. I'm very lucky. And I, I, um, I all, I'm always working, which is, a, a huge blessing but when I'm on hiatus from the Goldbergs I'm I'm usually doing something else and I mean paint we did two years ago now so that's finally debuting in in May which I can't wait for people to see but um yeah I'm lucky I'm, I'm a lucky girl I'm lucky to get a chance to speak with you again You're so, so thank sweet. you so much it's been such a pleasure You're so sweet